uh, Noel Hamiel is the author of uh, the book we're talking about today. And he's a South Dakota native and a career journalist who retired in 2007 and then spent five years traveling the state for the South Dakota Community Foundation, helping communities establish their own philanthropic funds. His first book, Sketches from South Dakota, was published in 2001. Um, a former state legislator, Noel was inducted into the South Dakota Newspaper Hall of Fame in 2012. He and his wife, Janet, live in Rapid City. They have three adult grown daughters and 10 grandchildren. Uh, Noel, if there's anything else you want by way of introduction, you can add it, but I will cede the floor to you right now. Thank you, Cody. Thanks, Catherine. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I am familiar with the South Dakota Historical Society and, and uh, all the great work it does for South Dakota. And by the way, during the research for this book, which took a couple of years, that isn't eight hour days, but it was a two year project. And I, uh, I got a lot of help and cooperation from the archives <clears throat> uh, of your society. So I do wanna thank everybody for that. Um, you know, it's kind of a gruesome topic during the Advent season, I guess. Cody, did you have anything to do with that selection or? I won't put you on the spot. It wasn't me. Oh. Yeah, we're, we're, we're happy to have you here nonetheless. <laughs> okay. Um, gruesome though it is, uh, it is, uh, it, it started out as a, a kind of a dream. You know, this, this horrendous crime happened 41 years ago and it was on my mind for many years. And when I retired from newspapering, I continued to write a, a column for weekly papers and a Sunday column for the Rapid City Journal. And one day I, I thought to myself, you know, most of the people involved in the Mathis case were still living, but not all of them. The judge had passed. Um, uh, and so I thought maybe if there was a time to write this, that would be the time. And so that's, that, was, uh, that was a motivating factor. But there were a couple of other reasons that, that I did the book. And I guess the crime was so diabolical uh, because it involved um, a 30 year old farm mom and her two children, ages two and four. And it's just like the worst fiction murder story you've ever read. They were shot at point blank range while they were sleeping in their beds in this makeshift home because their home had been destroyed by lightning. And so they were living in this machine shed and this intruder by stealth um, came in in the middle of the night, sometime between two and four in the morning and with a 22 caliber rifle, um, shot them. And, you know, there, it was, I mean, I suppose you could argue that all crimes or all murders are senseless, but this one seemed to be uh, uh, beyond the pale. One of the investigators told me that all, all homicides are awful, but since this one involved these two young children, it made it even more. Uh, horrific. So that was that was one reason that I proceeded with the book. The second reason is the obvious one. It's an unsolved crime. Uh, it's true that um, the husband of LaDonna Mathis was arrested and charged, went to trial, but he was acquitted. And so nobody has ever been punished for these for these for the loss of these three lives. So that was that was a motivating factor. And then I guess the last reason was that it struck me that these people, the, these three people's lives were cut short. Uh, they didn't have a chance. We had a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and, and as I mentioned earlier, a 30-year-old uh, farm wife. And it just seemed like there ought to be some record of, of their life and what happened other than uh, yellowing newspaper clippings in a scrapbook someplace. So that's really why I, I proceeded with, with the book. What I wanted to do tonight <clears throat> was show you some photos 
that will help tell the story. Uh, and I have uh, those to show you, and I will uh, just try to explain each one as I scroll through. Um, and then there'll be time for questions afterward. The other thing about the, the murder though, that of September 8th, 1981, is that it came at a time in South Dakota's history when it was, it wasn't just the, the type of murder, but South Dakota had had murders in the past. Um, the most famous one was the shooting of Wild Bill Hickok in 1877. And I know the viewers are familiar with the other cases, the, the um, um, Robert Lee Roy Anderson case, uh, the Dollar, Donald Moeller case. There's five or six of them that, that have gotten a lot of coverage over the years. They all occurred after the Mathis case, except for Wild Bill Hickok. But the difference is, in each one of those cases, someone was held accountable. Someone was arrested, they either confessed, they committed suicide, there was a closure to the case. Uh, but in the case of the Mathis murders, um, it remains uh, technically anyway an open case. So that's what, that's another reason that I thought it was worthy of a book. <clears throat> So we're going to look at the first image. Is that image on the screen now? Can I ask? Um, yeah, the cover of the book. Okay, yep, the cover's up. So the cover of the book, South Dakota's Mathis Murders, and the publisher of this book uh, wanted to know uh, at some point during this process what I envisioned for for a book cover, and I said. Well, I know what I don't want to see, and that's I didn't want to see uh, pictures of the victims. I didn't want to sensationalize this. Um, sort of been um, repelled by tabloid journalism in my career, and I didn't think that we should exploit the the victims of this murder. But I said maybe we could figure out a way to portray the the crime scene. It's it's rural South Dakota. It's it's a farmstead north of Mount Vernon, which is, you know, just 12 miles or so west of Mitchell, South Dakota, 80 miles west of Sioux Falls, but it's it's eight miles north and a mile east of Mount Vernon. Uh, so it's it's uh, sits out there in the middle of the prairie. Maybe we could portray it, somehow capture the remoteness um, in the in the cover. Um, and so the people that make those decisions wanted to know if I had a photo and I did. What, what you see on the cover is an actual photo of the Mathis farmstead. And so they were, they put the rest of it together and um, that's how the cover came to be. The next uh, photo on your screen are pictures of the victims. Uh, on the left is uh, Brian, uh, age four. Um, of course, LaDonna Mathis is on the right. She's uh, 30 years old in that picture. That's her um, engagement photo. Patrick is age two. And I believe that that picture of the two boys was taken shortly before the murders occurred. Um, LaDonna was a, a farm girl who grew up uh, near Dimmick. Um, she went to school in Corsica. She uh, apparently was a talented girl, uh, popular. She was good with numbers. She actually worked at a bank. Um, uh, before her marriage to John Mathis. So this is a picture of LaDonna Mathis on her wedding day. And we've all seen photos like this. Um, her father, Lorenz Gerlach, that was her maiden name, 
uh, is beaming during the wedding. They were happy with her choice of John Mathis. He was uh, a successful young farmer. He, uh, his farm, of course, was north of Mount Vernon, but he appeared to be and was, from all accounts, able to um, provide uh, a stable and good living for, for their daughter, LaDonna. And so they were, they were pleased with the matchup. They had met at a uh, dance in Mitchell, um, which is where the courtship began. And uh, that was, of course, a happy day for, for um, LaDonna. This is the only photo um, that I included in the book of the interior of the machine shop. You can see one of the Department of Criminal Investigation <clears throat> employees on the left corner. The way it was configured is that there were four beds lined up in a row. The one closest to the door was John Mathis, then LaDonna, um, then Brian, and then Patrick. And then there was a, a, uh, a crib at the foot of LaDonna's bed because there was a third son who was not in the shed that night. His name was Duane. He was eight months old and he was staying with uh, his paternal grandparents. And so he escaped the carnage. Um, of all the crime scene photos, I thought this one illustrated, you know, the living conditions. They didn't have indoor plumbing. They didn't have an indoor kitchen. They didn't have running water. Um, the house that was struck by lightning uh, the previous July, that was actually the second fire. There was an earlier fire the same month, I think July 8th, <clears throat> that was suspicious. Um, when the fire marshal investigated that fire, they detected some accelerant on the carpet in the basement. Uh, so it was a suspicious fire, but never really uh, proven to be arson. But then two, two weeks later, um, uh, lightning struck the house and uh, damaged it to the point where it wasn't uh, inhabitable. So they moved to this machine shed, which was just close by. And this photo is, is uh, pretty much illustrates what the family was contending with. The, the morning of the, I should back up a little bit. Um, the killings happened um, between two and four on September 8th. <clears throat> um, still summer, but people were thinking of fall. Uh, John Mathis, by his account, um, had helped his youngest son uh, go to the bathroom. His son needed, it was, they used a, a pail inside the building and he helped his youngest son urinate in the pail. And then he thought, well, since I'm up anyway, I'm gonna go outside and, and check my hogs. Uh, the Mathis has raised hogs as well as farmed. And John Mathis uh, said that he went out and again, this is pretty primitive, but he decided that he had to relieve himself. The family used the wooded area outside the house for their bathroom facilities. But he, <clears throat> his, his account was that he went to the farrying barn, checked his hogs, um, came back to the house. And as he was about to enter the house, the walkthrough door in the machine shed flung open and a masked man, a hooded man, rushed out with a gun and confronted him. And they struggled. And the gun discharged. John Mathis was shot in the left arm and he passed out. When he uh, regained consciousness, he walked or crawled to the machine shed and, and got on the phone and called uh, the sheriff's department 
in Mount Vernon and told them that his family had been killed and would they come quick and bring an ambulance. And that was shortly before four o'clock. It was like 3.55 or 3.56 in the morning. One of the ironies of this story is the person that he called, the deputy on duty for the Davidson County Sheriff's Department, was based in Mount Vernon, which is in the county. But the deputy's name was Doug Kirkus. John Mathis and Doug Kirkus were classmates at Mount Vernon. They had 27 kids in the class and they were classmates. And so when John Mathis reported the crime, his call went to Doug Kirkus. And, and in those days, some of you may be wondering, why did he call his personal house number? They were the same number. The, the number for the deputy sheriff in Mount Vernon and his home number were, was the same number so that people could, could reach them. So that's how the crime was reported. And uh, Kirkus got out of bed, got dressed, put on his bulletproof vest and drove at high speeds to the farmstead. And when he got there, um, he discovered that John Mathis, his father, Vern, was also entering the driveway and they virtually entered the machine shed together uh, to discover John Mathis uh, kneeling at the bed of LaDonna Mathis and uh, Deputy Kirkus did an inventory and found that all three of the, of the people were, were dead. This is a picture of Lyle Swenson who took charge of the investigation that morning. Uh, Lyle Swenson arrived on the scene uh, shortly after the ambulance arrived. Uh, this picture, I believe, was taken either the day of or, or the next day. And I included it <clears throat> because I thought that his expression uh, illustrated his frustration, his sadness, uh, his uh, wonderment at how all this took place. Uh, because from the very beginning, it was a mystery. Uh, John Mathis recounted his story, and yet there were things uh, that perplexed Swenson uh, because they couldn't find a gun. They couldn't find any evidence of a struggle in front of the shed uh, that John Mathis described. Um, and so they... They didn't find any tire tracks. They didn't find any footprints that would indicate uh, that someone had been there from someplace else. And so Swenson is thinking, um, I'm not sure that I'm getting the full story from, from John Mathis. Three days after the murders, this scene now is at the Salem Lutheran Church in Mount Vernon. and. On the, on the left is Vern Mathis Sr. In the center with his left arm in the sling is John Mathis. And on the right is the funeral director from Mitchell at that time, uh, a gentleman named Denny Will. It was a packed funeral. Um, more than 300 people upstairs overflowed in the basement. They had to listen by speakers. And about the only incident that occurred was some of the family were, were irritated that the media and camera people were trying to get too close to the service. And so that was really the only um, blemish on the day so far as the accounts I read were concerned. This is a picture of the presiding judge for the Mathis trial, which was ultimately held in Yankton. But <clears throat> before this, something interesting occurred. The investigation continued. Um, DCI agents, Mitchell Police, um, Sheriff's Department scoured the Mathis farmstead for a gun because the investigators had determined that a 22 caliber rifle had been used to, to commit the murders, but they could not find a murder weapon. And they looked everywhere. They they walked shoulder to shoulder uh, around their nine buildings in the farmstead. They didn't know 
if the gun had been hidden in any one of them, so they searched every one of them. They searched the land around the buildings. They, they, their search extended to a three mile radius, no gun. But the attorney general, Mark Meyer Henry determined that there was enough evidence that pointed to John Mathis that he wanted a grand jury impaneled, which was done by Judge Bogue, who was the presiding judge of the circuit. And the grand jury, um, after hearing testimony, indicted John Mathis on three counts of murder. And um, he was uh, incarcerated on the fourth floor of the, of the uh, Davidson County Jail. His lawyers asked that Judge Bogue step aside, which was his right. And the picture you see there is uh, Thomas Andhurst, who was uh, a judge in Lake County in Madison, and he was tabbed to take over the case. One of the first things he had to do was deal with a, a motion to change uh, the trial's location from Mitchell to Yankton, which he ultimately uh, approved. This is a picture of the ongoing search for the gun at the Memphis farmstead. Now they were, this picture shows them uh, excavating some of the, one of the lagoons, septic tanks, sewage pits, whatever you want to call it, because uh, hogs were raised in the confinement building and, and uh, there was a lot of animal waste uh, that was on the, on the land. One of the things that happened after the search turned up no guns, they went to the farrowing barn, which was a confinement building, and the, and the uh, confinement building is uh, hogs were raised on concrete slats. The waste would drop below, creating a, a lagoon of animal waste. They pumped out animal waste until they could get down in into the uh, floor of the confinement building. There's still three or four foot of waste, but <clears throat> two volunteers, um, Danny Kamick from the Mitchell Police Department and Bernie Christensen, who was assistant director of DCI at that time, volunteered to go down and see if the rifle was to be found. And they put on wetsuits, oxygen tanks, uh, fire helmets, um, and went down to see if they could, and they crisscrossed the floor of the, of the pit and they were not able to find a gun, but what did happen is that Bernie Christensen ran out of oxygen, and there's a beeper that, that sends a, a sound out when, when oxygen is low, and it started beeping, and all the hogs that were on the floor up above moved to the other side where Danny Kamick was looking and let go, and it was literally raining animal waste on then he came and they got both the men out. The firemen were there, they hosed them down. And I only recount that to illustrate the depths that investigators went to, to try to find this missing murder weapon. This is a picture of John Mathis and his three boys. Um, <clears throat> Dwayne is eight, well, I don't know for sure how old he is, but this picture, again, was taken only a few months before the murders. And I had trouble getting this included in the book because the publisher was pretty adamant about uh, running photos that were clear and, and distinct and high quality. And I, I argued the case that this was the only photo that I was able to come up with that show John Mathis with his three sons, Brian on the left, Dwayne, and then Patrick. And I just felt it was important for readers to be able to visualize uh, the three boys with their dad. This is a picture of uh, Doug Kirkus, the deputy sheriff who took the call that night with John Mathis. After the grand jury indicted him, Doug Kirkus uh, picked up and arrested John Mathis at a nearby restaurant in Mitchell. 
and brought him in. And he, uh, I think that picture was that they were on their way to uh, uh, a bail hearing in the Davidson County Courthouse. <clears throat> Wally Eklund was the attorney that the Mathis family called. Wally Eklund was um, um, a ranch kid uh, from out north of Wood, South Dakota, Millette County. Um, he got acquainted with the Johnson uh, law firm in Gregory because his family needed some legal work done and he went away to USD and USD Law School and he came back and joined the firm, which became the Johnson Eklund Law Firm. Uh, the firm was at that time headed up by George Johnson and his son was Rick Johnson, who had carved out uh, a reputation for himself as a leading trial lawyer in South Dakota. And at this stage, Wally Eklund was the uh, attorney on point uh, to defend John Mathis uh, from his uh, murder charges. This is the more famous of the two, <clears throat> Rick Johnson, who was born uh, without an arm below the left elbow. And it in no way hindered his ability to try cases or to play racquetball or to play golf, so his friends said. Um, Rick Johnson was known throughout the state as being one of the toughest lawyers um, and one of the best if you needed a trial lawyer or a defense lawyer. And he um, was famous in the state. And the attorney general at that time, Mark Meyer Henry, who, as I mentioned before, uh, asked the grand jury to be convened. Another interesting aspect of this case, not only did Doug Kirkus and, and uh, John Mathis go to school together with classmates, but <clears throat> Rick Johnson and Mark Meyer Henry were classmates at the University of South Dakota School of Law. They were also classmates in Gregory. They played on the same football team. Rick Johnson was two years ahead of Mark Meyer Henry, but again, we have all these intersections of uh, folks involved in this case, which only added to the interest of the case. But of course, from a media standpoint, it provided a lot of additional things to write about. But Rick Johnson was uh, a formidable uh, trial lawyer. This is a picture of Wally Eklund on the left, John Mathis in the middle, Rick Johnson. I wish I knew why he was smiling. I couldn't figure that out. Something caught his funny bone and uh, his associate, uh, Wally Eklund, seems to be a little more stern. On the far right is John Mathis' older brother, Vern Mathis Jr. This, pic this picture I thought was the best photo in the book and I just must mention and, and give a little shout out to Kelly Hertz of the Yankton Press in Dakotan. In my research, I saw this photo and it was in the Yankton paper. And I happen to know Kelly, I uh, have known him for decades. So I called him and I said, hey, Kelly, would you go downstairs in that morgue that you have the wrap in the uh, Yankton paper and, and pull a picture from October I don't mean October, I mean, this is the trial. So this would have been the, uh, probably April of 1982. And I sent him a copy of the picture. And he, he called me back and his voice is, I could not find that photo anywhere. I looked and looked and looked. You know, the negatives are, are supposedly filed by week, month and year. And this is 40 years previous. Well. Two weeks later, I get an envelope in the mail, and it's the negative with this picture. Kelly had found it and sent it to me. And so I wanted to credit the Yankton Press and Dakotan and, and Kelly for, for what I think is possibly the best picture in the book. This picture is of uh, Lorenz and Evelyn Gerlach, Donna Mathis's parents 
And this is from an update story, I believe in the Mitchell Daily Republic. <clears throat> what newspapers do for crimes like this is five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, they, they do update stories. And this is one of those. And they asked the Gerlachs to pull the picture of the two slain grandsons and LaDonna. And uh, uh, I think you can see Evelyn Gerlach never, ever recovered, nor would you expect her to, but she never, ever recovered from this. And she was <coughs> later in life quoted as saying she was always disappointed that, that law enforcement wasn't able to bring uh, the murder of her family to justice. And most people can understand her feeling on that. This is uh, Wally Eklund, who went on to not only be a successful lawyer, but went on to become a, a circuit judge out in Rapid City for a number of years and uh, was, by all accounts, uh, a fair judge and a good judge. When I would, <clears throat> and I did a lot of the interviews by telephone for this book, Wally Eklund lived in Rapid City, but by the time I started my research, he had moved, he'd retired and he'd moved back to Gregory. And I know I talked to him two or three times and he was always helpful, but he would pick up his cell phone and he might be in the coffee shop in Gregory. Oh yeah, he says, go ahead, ask whatever you need to ask. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, if every reporter had that kind of luck calling people for stories, uh, reporters' lives would be a lot easier. Wally Eklund was, was, was cooperative and I appreciated it. They're standing outside the uh, courtroom door uh, during recess uh, during John Mathis's trial. Mark Meyer Henry is the gentleman with the AG cap on and right below him on the right is Bernie Christensen who was assistant DCI director and involved in the <coughs> investigation. On the left is the pilot and the plane that they're in is I believe a DC-7. It was a plane that was confiscated um, in 1980. It came with 25 or 26 ton of marijuana bales and it landed um, I think on Super Bowl Sunday up in Walworth County. And the perpetrator's idea was to land at an airstrip at night and they had some lights out there and they didn't think anybody would be around. So they were bringing this illegal cargo in and they were going to land there and then distribute it and then take it by truck to Minneapolis, St. Paul and distribute it. What they didn't realize that, that up there, you know, south of Moore Bridge up where it's colder, a lot of men ice fish and not everybody watched the Super Bowl. And so when they landed the plane, there were some ice fishermen that saw it and they were just really wondering, well, why would a plane that size land out in the middle of nowhere? So they drove their pickups over, they parked in front of the plane, they called law enforcement and it was a huge drug bust. And the reason that this picture in the story is mentioned is because one of the theories as to why the Mathis family was shot was because one of the theories was that John Mathis had witnessed this drug bust and there was a, a contract put out on his family. The, the story had no credence, but it wasn't the only story, uh, the only alternative theory as to who might have killed John Mathis's family. Um, another theory was that there was a bus uh, at a farmstead next door to Mathis's. Um, people lost a lot of money. They were angered by it. And so they, again, put out a contract and John Mathis didn't happen to be in the house when the contract was executed. Not much credence was ever given to that either. But these were theories that people were coming up with to explain why would anybody kill LaDonna Mathis and two kids, if, I mean, was the mass man theory true or, or was John Mathis guilty as charged? 
This is a photo of the court reporter. Um, and he recounted to me <clears throat> that he had never, he was uh, Judge Anhurst's uh, court reporter. And he said that of all the trials that he had handled for Judge Anhurst, not one was as emotional as this one. He said before the trial was completed, <clears throat> the judge himself, the jurors, everybody had tears in their eyes because it was such a, it was such an awful, awful trial. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the law enforcement and um, prosecution team for the Mathis trial. Starting on the left, lower left is Dennis Holmes, who just recently retired as US attorney in Sioux Falls, I think last year. He was the number two guy after the middle person, Mark Meyer Henry in the middle, Lyle Swenson on the right, in the back row, uh, John Erickson, who was in charge of making sure that the evidence and properties were lined up for trial, given uh, their presentation on any given day. Um, Ken Giggling was a DCI agent from Chamberlain. Then we have Doug Kirkus, the deputy sheriff who was first on the scene. And then we have Dave Muller, uh, who now lives in Spearfish. And he was in charge primarily of the uh, DCI investigation. And I believe that is the last photo in the presentation. 